welcome you to our brown bag lecture for today. Um, I have the honor of introducing Don Gayton. Uh, he is a local for, uh, forest ecologist, grassland ecologist. He lives in Summerland. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about the role of fire in forest ecology. And we were just talking before the presentation, and this last summer was one of the, was the worst uh, fire season on record. So I thought it would be appropriate to bring him in and talk about that and in the face of climate change and how, um, we're, I don't know if you're going to touch on climate change, but you're going to talk about the role of fire in forest ecology. So I'll let you take it away. I've worked in fire ecology for a couple of decades in the southern interior and in various places in the Okanagan, in the, in the <coughs> Kootenays and in the uh, East Kootenays and the Boundary Country. And it's been a kind of a passion of mine and it interfaces quite nicely with grassland ecology, which is part of the whole equation here in, in uh, Southern Interior. Uh, I have very limited firefighting experience, uh, but a, f a whole lot of fire ecology experience. And so I thought I'd kind of give you some background, which I think is kind of a missing component in our understanding of fire in the Southern Interior. 2017 was the first worst fire year on record in BC in terms of the number of hectares burned. Uh, and it may be a portent of things to come, uh, it may not be. The caribou got hit really, really hard. There was a, a, uh, a lightning storm in, in mid-July, I believe, that started a huge number of fires and they persisted right up until, uh, uh, many of them right up until September. Uh, Ashcroft was another area that got hit really badly. 1,030 fires, you can imagine how stretched the firefighting uh, services would be were in this situation. Uh, new fires starting every day. Uh, and we still don't know how much this year cost us in terms of firefighting costs uh, and also, you know, loss of, of uh, structures and, and timber and so on. Uh, I want to focus down on the, on the South Okanagan or the Okanagan and uh, look at this from an ecological perspective. Uh, how many of you, raise your hands, know what the biogeoclimatic classification system is? <laughs> uh, I was afraid of that. Well, it's, it's really cool. It's like the grammar of BC's ecosystems. There's about 40 different types. And the ones that we're going to focus on today are three. The bunch grass, it's called a subzone, the ponderosa pine, and the interior Douglas fir. Those collectively are called NDT4. You know, governments and scientists love acronyms. Natural Disturbance Type 4. Uh, Ecosystems that historically, and that's a very important uh, qualifier, ecosystems that historically experienced frequent stand maintaining fires as opposed to a stand replacement fire where everything burns down and the forest starts over. So this is a really important concept that hasn't been around in, in, in our thinking for very long uh, that we need to look at fire from an ecological perspective. If you move up into the lodgepole pine, you have a totally different fire regime uh, historically. When I say historical, I'm meaning basically from about 1600, which was kind of, we still have some records. Uh, it was a modern climatic period up to about 1880 when uh, European settlement began to have effects on, uh, on uh, natural resources and ecosystems and so on. So, Within those three subzones, prior to 1880, typically there was a fire somewhere in every 100 hectares or whatever block of the, between five and 35 years. Now the paradox of frequent fire is the more often it burns, the less damage it does. There's less time for fuel accumulation, which is the key to uh, understanding fire. How do we know that? Uh, I'm so glad you asked. Uh, we know that through uh, 
uh, the science of dendrochronology or to more, put more of a point to it, the science of dendropyrology, uh, which is quite fascinating and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Anyway, this is a, a larch that we cut down in, over in Canal Flats. It uh, germinated around 1600 and then each one of those arrows points to a fire scar. So that's how we uh, came by this historical information. Uh, they're not all that common on the landscapes, there's getting to be fewer and fewer of them, but we are starting to get a good database of fire return intervals, uh, historical fire return intervals in the southern interior. And that's an example of how you you trace that fire scar right back to the very end, tip end, and then you can tell which year the fire occurred in. And if it's a really good sample, you can actually tell whether it was a spring fire or a fall fire, whether it's in early wood or late wood. So it's really cool. It's very tedious as well. But uh, We've all had the, the high school science class about the fire triangle. There's actually an equally important fire triangle, and that's this one, that includes humans. Humans evolved with fire. Uh, it was part of our evolutionary development, and uh, it carries on today. That, that five to 35 year fire return interval in the dry ecosystems of the southern interior was partly lightning and partly First Nations use of fire for a host of different reasons. Probably primarily to enhance forage and shrubs for game, wild ungulates, also for enhancing berry crops, for improving, improving sight lines, uh, for general safety purposes, uh, it was a major part of their culture. We don't know exactly how, what percentage of that five to 35 year fire return interval was First Nations use, but you know, wild guesses, maybe 30 up to 50% of those fires were uh, started purposely by First Nations and the rest were lightning caused. This is Annie Kruger, she was the firekeeper for the Penticton Indian Band. She's passed away a few years ago. A uh, wonderful woman. The, the role of firekeeper on, in, within First Nations is a lifetime position, which I think makes a lot of sense because fire is one of the most complex uh, forces in nature. It's incredibly random, it's incredibly unpredictable. It takes a lifetime to understand how fire works. This is what I refer to, uh, that problematic gap in terms of fuel accumulation and fuel breakdown. If you're on the coast, you know, in Vancouver Island or in the north coast, lots of fuel is produced, but it breaks down right away because it's humid, it's, it's wet, the bugs get at the, the wood right away and it becomes humus, which is basically unburnable. Here, fuels kind of fossilize. It takes decades and decades for fuels to break down and become non-flammable. And when I say fuels, this is what I'm talking about. Standing trees, fallen needles, bark, branches, uh, and fallen trees, as well as the uh, dead grass, dead shrubs, and so on. So this is why Fire is such a critical component in these dry ecosystems that the more often it burns, the less damage you do. We can, we can adjust that equation a little bit through logging and, and various things, but fire is, is the predominant um, driver. Here's a couple of shots of kind of classical ecosystems that are relics of, of that frequent fire return interval. This is over near uh, Kimberley. Uh, widely spaced mature trees and the bark on those trees is probably two inches thick and it, they're essentially fireproof. There's no limbs down close to the ground so if a fire does come through on the, a ground oriented fire doesn't have a chance to get up into the canopy. Uh, 
Uh, there's lots of sunlight hitting the ground, so you've got good forage underneath for wild ungulates, uh, shrubs, and so on. There's a lot of diversity there. Uh, here's another one that's close to home, uh, actually um, on the way up to, uh, let's say, on the way up towards the, the observatory, uh, and you're winding up that steep hill off of Highway 97. This is off to your left on that, on that hillside. And again, you can see uh, big, mature, essentially fireproof veteran trees, very few uh, juveniles, very few juveniles, because like I say, if a, if a fire goes through and, a, and the seedlings are up to say three or four meters tall, they get taken out right away. So there's lots of room and lots of, of sunlight, nutrients, and moisture for uh, diversity, shrubs, and so on to, uh, to perpetuate. There aren't very many of these, or these sites left. Uh, I guess because I'm getting so old, I, I like historical stuff uh, and, you know, I've been studying history so long now, I'm kind of part of history, I guess. Uh, George Mercer Dawson, the father of Canadian geology, passed through the East Kootenays uh, in 1883. And uh, I thought, well, this is cool. I actually got these images from the National Archives in Ottawa. And I thought it would be really cool to go and, you know, find these locations and re-photograph them. And, and, uh, so this is the very north end of, uh, of uh, Brainlock. Anyway, that's the, he that's the headwaters of the Columbia River right there. It flows north out of the, out of, uh, the lake. And I thought, well, this will be easy to find. And, you know, and I started scrambling up this bluff there and, and you know, with my five ounce camera thinking, God, George Dawson was this tiny little man who had polio as a child. And he was probably packing 100 pounds worth of camera equipment up this steep grade. I finally got up to that little bench there, and then I realized there was quite a nice old pathway that came up from the other side. <laughs> but uh, anyway, if you look at that point of land that juts out into the lake there uh, and see the changes in uh, close to 100 or a little bit over 100 years, it's really hard to go from the old camera formats to the modern ones so that the perspective isn't quite what it should be. But you can see it's gone from, uh, you know, a mosaic of grassland, closed forest, open forest, and there's plenty of evidence, if you look closely, of, of uh, burnt trees and stumps. Now it's essentially all closed forest. There's Banff in 1902. There's the Banff town site uh, on the lower left. Moving forward to 1996, look at the hill, the change on the hillside, or the mountainside. So it's no wonder that the elk hang out in downtown Banff, because there was no forage up there uh, for them. Uh, this one's closer to home, uh, White Lake, 1895, and I remember uh, being out there uh, with a colleague of mine wandering around the White Lake Air Basin trying to figure out where this photograph was taken, and, and I was asking this fellow who was familiar with the area, I said, where do you suppose this was taken? And he said, well, Don, if you look at that bluff right there. So, yeah, it's embarrassing sometimes, but if you look at the the hillside between the bluff and the sagebrush, uh, even in that bone-dry, semi-desert ecosystem, there is what we call forest ingrowth as a result of fire suppression. The Americans have done a huge amount of this kind of historical fire ecology work, and they've dug up uh, any number of photographs this is a fairly similar ecosystem to what we're dealing with. It's a, it's a little higher, but then again, you're farther south, so it's a drier, uh, warmer ecosystem. You can see, and that's actually the same photo point, uh, 19, 
1909 and 1989, the tremendous change in uh, over time. Uh, this is, looks quite scary, but uh, these are. Uh, this is a, a project that Laurie Daniels and Alexander Pogue just finished on the west side of Vaso Lake. Uh, that strip kind of runs from the north end to the south end of the lake. And each one of those uh, horizontal bars represents an individual fire scar tree. And each little uh, vertical tick represents a fire scar. So, and then you have the, the years across the bottom. So I want you to look up at the very top where uh, Daniels and Pogue have broken this up into uh, four different eras. The traditional uh, pre-contact First Nations involvement, the colonial period when, when Europeans first arrived, the railway period, when you know the railway went right along uh, the uh, west side of Vassoli, and the modern period. So, in the traditional period, there was a fire somewhere on that 400 hectares every seven years. Uh, it slowed down once uh, uh, once the Europeans arrived, but then as the railways came through, there were sources of ignition all the time. Uh, that was coupled with the drought period in the, in the 30s. There were some huge fires, and you can see that one was at 19, about 1930 or so. Every, every tree was scarred by that fire, so it was obviously a massive fire. Then as you move into the, to the modern period, effective fire suppression in BC started basically after World War II. It was kind of gearing up in the late 30s, but after World War II, it really got started uh, very effectively. And you can see the influence of that. It's a brilliant study. Uh, I have copies of it if anyone is interested. Uh, they did a huge amount of work, and this is actually the, me the most definitive fire history study done in the Okanagan to date. Uh, but then this, us amateurs, you know, wanted to try out uh, their skills. So I got a chance to do a, a small fire history on a little tiny ecological reserve just south of Summerland. If anyone knows the Summerland Golf Course, it's just, uh, just adjacent to the golf course. Uh, pretty typical of the ecosystems of the South Okanagan. Here is, uh, you can see the golf course in green and uh, the reserve is basically in that, in that loop uh, where Trout Creek goes through. Uh, I do have had to contend with uh, a, a few uh, uh, f organisms that weren't real keen on me going there, but uh, uh, anyway, this was a great weight loss clinic of cutting down the cookies and then packing them out along with the chainsaw, so uh, it was actually a lot of fun. But that's my little minor contribution to fire history in the South Okanagan. Uh, a very similar layout, each, each uh, horizontal line represents a tree uh, and each vertical tick represents a fire. It's really challenging to, to pick out a fire scar in core samples, so we basically have to sacrifice the tree and get a cookie, which is, you know, uh, there's cookies in the back, but there's also cookies up here that you can look at. Um, once in a while you can do it with a core, but uh, it's very hard uh, to hit just right to get that, that fire scar. Uh, so, and then the beauty of it is, it is you can cut down live trees that have fire scars, but you can find a, m many stumps or old dead trees that also have fire scars. And then the challenge is how do you date, you don't know whether that tree died 20 years ago or 80 years ago. So it's a, a really cool process that archeologists actually worked out uh, in terms of how do you use um, dead material uh, that you don't know when it died. That's the thumbnail of the fire history in the Trout Creek Ecological Reserve. 
uh, first recorded fire, that doesn't mean that it, the fire started in 1730, it's just that that was the first, the oldest scar I could find. Uh, and the last recorded fire in 1952. This one, where you got all those lines, that's a 1933 fire, and I was actually able to confirm that in the newspaper archives about a, a, a fire in 1933. So from an ecological perspective, if you have a, an 18 year historical fire return interval and you've gone 65 years without a fire, then we say in ecological terms that this is an ecosystem that is three times departed from its historic, historical norm. And it's gonna either experience uh, a catastrophic fire and start over, um, or we get in and, and, and try and do something about it. Um, we actually have some pretty good air photos from 1938, believe it or not. I actually kind of wonder what kind of an airplane it was that was flying in 1938, but uh, you can see this, this is the same, uh, this, the same part of the ecological re reserve. You can see even in this dry, south-facing aspect, the amount of infill uh, by ponderosa pine in that time period. This is what an awful lot of, of the South Okanagan looks like. A few of the veteran trees, uh, but then you've got a lot of these young, pardon the phrase, pecker poles that are starting up. Uh, and there's, you know, there's burnt stumps there. But this is a, there's two really important species here. This is arrowleaf balsam root, a, a sun-loving native species that has the big yellow blooms in the spring. And this is Idaho fescue, which is the, sort of the queen of the, gra the bunch grasses in the Okanagan. Both of these species are sun-loving species and they will drop out over time because there's too much competition developing for sunlight, for moisture, for nutrients. You also see, you know, there's plenty of pine cones and needles on the ground, and so this, this former grassland ecosystem is shifting to a forest, and the soils will, becoming, will become cooler, uh, they'll become more acid, more conducive to uh, more of these juveniles starting up, um, and so this ecosystem is kind of on a hinge point route now. It's either going to go one way or the other. And this is a classic that you've probably seen, a beautiful vet that's probably 200 years old, uh, a huge amount of duff accumulated. If a fire gets in here, even a light fire, it'll get into that duff, and the roots of the tree have grown into the duff, and so it will parboil the roots, even if it doesn't consume the tree, and you know, that fall or the next spring, the tree will die. If we do prescribe burning, that's step one, is to rake these, the old vets that you want to save, because sure enough, that will, uh, that's a death sentence if you leave that kind of duff there. I convinced BC Parks to try uh, a, a test burn in, in the ecological reserve, and, and this is a typical time that you do it in the first week of April, because you dial in the perfect weather conditions for a burn, where you're going to get consumption without a risk of escape. Um, the BC wildfire guys did it on our behalf. They love doing this stuff. They're very good at it. They're like surgeons. They know exactly the right conditions and the right tools to do it. Uh, so we, we created what we called a black line around the area that we wanted to burn. And we, we did do a certain amount of overachievement since the parks people weren't there to watch. Uh, and somebody handed me a drip torch and, torch, and boy, is that ever fun. Uh, I didn't have the, the uh, certified Nomex uh, suit, but, uh, and uh, that, my boot is not on fire. That's actually a, a, another drip torch. But anyway, you can play God. You can say, okay, sh you live and you die. <laughs> uh, but you can really control the speed and the intensity of the fire by the, you do these strips with the drip torches. And if you want things to go slowly, you widen the strips and, or, or shorten the strips. And then 
they, they burn together and, and, and the fire goes out and then you start the next one. And uh, it's a fascinating technology. Uh, I was kind of worried about what's it going to do to my beloved bunch grasses. And so I marked this bunch grass right here as a mature blue bunch wheatgrass, uh, April 3rd. Came back in May and it's doing fine. And in fact, you can see, here is the edge of the black line that we, and you can see the arrow leaf balsam root said, thank you very much for that little burn. Uh, this has kind of been our approach to uh, fire suppression in BC. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm not dissing the firefighters. They do an incredible job. And these guys are full on board in terms of doing prescribed burning. They very rarely get the chance uh, for a whole host of reasons which we can talk about. Uh, but even in spite of uh, active fire suppression, this is a map from IMAP BC, which is a fascinating uh, uh, publicly available site. These are all the fires that have been mapped since about 1935 when they, the, the wildfire guys are really anal, they just collect data, they love data. And so uh, there's the Okanagan Mountain Park fire. The, the, there are no dates on these, but, and that's the Finley Creek fire from last summer right there. Uh, there was a West Bench fire that might be one of these, I'm not sure. Uh, this was probably the Carmi fire. Uh, anyway, it's all there and you can see how in spite of our best attempts, we still have forest fires. Uh, some of my colleagues and I, we vie for the, the, the horror shot. Uh, in a, <laughs> so this is like, this is like, having five inches of gasoline on the forest floor. This is, you know, there's 90% of it is dead. There's no biological activity in there. And it's just a, it's a Holocaust fire waiting to happen. Fortunately, that's over in the East Kootenai, so we don't need to worry about those guys. Uh, and then I'm sure like a lot of you, I read, you know, the Smokey the Bear comics as a kid eating my Cheerios in the morning. And I bought into this just hook, line, and sinker. You know, Bambi's mother was killed by forest fires. And, and it's actually one of the, it's a mythology. It's like a creation myth. It's not true. Surely in every big, very intense forest fire, a few animals are killed. But the, the uh, positive results, particularly for wild ungulates, deer, elk, sheep, goats, and so on, is hugely positive in terms of nutritious forage. Here's a classic shot from down in Montana, a really extreme fire. The two elk are saying, oh, I think we'll just camp out in the creek here for a while. And then the same site, uh, I think it was two years later, it, it's a paradise for elk forage. This was an interesting example, which I think uh, we should take to heart, the uh, Tai fire down near Wenatchee. Um, prior to this fire, the, the, uh, one of the crews had gone in and created this fire break here by not eliminating all the trees, but thinning them uh, and hauling out debris. I'm not sure if they did a prescribed burn here, but anyway, so the, the fire came through it was, a, you know, an August fire, just the worst possible conditions. 100% uh, mortality hit the fire break, became a ground fire, passed over it, went back outside of the fire break, 100% mortality again. So it shows the power of fuel manipulation. And, the, 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 you know, not only in, in, in slowing fires down, but giving the firefighters a, an opportunity to control it. I'm sort of moving into solutions now, and basically the solutions for fuel manipulation are uh, thinning and burning, uh, either alone or in combination. Uh, so that's what was done here. This is the stand originally, uh, same that south of Missoula there. Uh, <coughs> two years later, after they thinned and burned, uh, 2005, 
And I'm sorry for the poor focus, but here you can see there's shrubs starting to develop. Uh, these trees that are remaining have a chance to grow and develop. Uh, so there are definite ecological benefits to doing um, prescribed burning as well as safety benefits. And we all remember uh, the firestorm from Kelowna. We do, the province does a certain amount of, of fuel uh, manipulation, thinning and prescribed burning. It averages about 3,000 hectares a year in the entire province. But I can kind of see from the province's point of view, if they look at what we call the urban interface, you know, where cities like Penticton are butting up against dry uh, forests, there's a huge amount of that throughout BC. And if they start doing it for Penticton, then they have to do it for everybody and the costs are, are, uh, are staggering. So it's an issue, I think it's not a technical issue, it's not a scientific issue. It's a social issue that we need to think about. You know, we relied so long on Smokey the Bear of saying, look, we've got the wildfire service they have the technology, the equipment, they'll deal with this. We don't have to worry about forest fires. It's their problem. Actually, it's a social problem that we need to think about. And, you know, the two options are uh, just do crisis management, uh, which is kind of what we do right now. Uh, put the fires out as they come. Have these blowout years where we basically bankrupt uh, ourselves by firefighting or we go proactive and start doing some of this uh, fuel reduction, fuel modification in the urban interface areas. It's a huge challenge and I'm, I'm saying I don't have any quick answers but, but this is kind of where we're at and um, I think the result after 2003, which was another blowout year, a few programs were started to deal with this. They kind of ramped down after three or four years. Uh, we will likely get the same this time around. Uh, there'll be a little bit of funding for doing things, but then it'll kind of peter out and, and we go back to business as usual. My analogy is that uh, it's always easy to get money to, for emergency rooms, but it's hard to get money for prenatal care. And, and that's kind of where we're at. It just seems like too touchy-feely to go out and cut down a few trees, but that's actually what we need to do and, and to, to light a few fires. You know, probably the, the, the species that are most at, at risk are ground nesting birds, depending on the, on the time of year of the fire. But... Uh, you know, elk and deer have lived with fire since the end of the ice age. They're 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 keen. They're kind of twigged onto it. They can smell it before we can. They can sense it. Uh, you know, I mean, every year you hear about you know there's a, a a dead bear or a dead elk or something like that. But by and large, they are able to escape the fire, and then the benefits two or three or four years after the fire are hugely significant, particularly for the wild ungulates. And there, the other issue here in terms of biodiversity, if you take a hectare of grassland, like up on the, the Trout Creek Ecological Reserve, it has far higher biodiversity than the same hectare of closed forest. So you're losing biodiversity as you allow this ingrowth to happen. And you're also losing species at risk too that, that tend to make use of, of the grasslands and also the interface between the forest and the grasslands because you know, for any species, that's the ideal place to be is the interface because you can use the resources of both. Uh, our forests are moving down slope and uh, slowly eliminating those grasslands. Grasslands are the uh, Rodney danger fields of the ecosystems. They get no respect. So, uh, uh, but you know, I, I have to be realistic. That's not going to change uh, soon.
We have created hundreds of thousands of hectares of even-aged lodgepole pine throughout the central interior. Uh, and lodgepole is one of those trees that it's, uh, it's designed to burn. And any lodgepole that's over 100 years old is, is living on borrowed time. Either a fire is going to get it or the bugs will get it. Um, and in our forest management practices, we've created these huge swaths of even-aged lodgepole pine that are susceptible to wildfires and beetle infestations. You know, I think we've woken up to the fact that, gee, this was a pretty big mistake, but it's going to take a lot to undo it. Nature loves a mosaic, and we kind of like, you know, these uniform blocks of... of uh, so it's a challenge. Replanting less um, volatile plants uh, afterwards. There's been talk about uh, in that urban interface, you know, the band just above the suburbs and so on, of planting more broadleaf trees, you know, aspen and so on, which are not nearly as flammable as, as the conifers. But that is expensive. In some cases, it doesn't work. Um, I, I think probably the single biggest thing you can do is just reduce the stocking rate. You know, a lot of these areas have got several thousand trees per hectare, and historically they only had a couple hundred. That's the big difference. Uh, uh, sagebrush is extremely volatile. Uh, if you ever get to go on a prescribed burn of sagebrush, it's really fun because in 30 seconds the plant's gone. I mean, a big thing like that is, is uh, Sagebrush, so it's, sagebrush is a bit of a no-no. Uh, surprising enough, cedar is incredibly volatile, particularly dead cedars that, uh, anyway, the Okanagan seems to be the world capital of cedar hedges and, 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 and the, the, the firefighters refu ref, ref, they refer to the cedar hedges as the, few, uh, as the fuse that leads to the house. Uh, uh, and well, yeah, I mean, cedar shake roofs is, is that's a bit of a no-brainer. Uh, you know, we're not gonna get rid of cedar hedges, but like in Summerland where I live, when they started imposing, you know, the higher water fees and so on, a lot of, there's a lot of dead cedar trees that are still there from like three years ago. <laughs> and I'm thinking, come on, you guys. They're not only but ugly, they're a huge fire. Uh, so things like yews are just as effective as cedars in terms of creating a green fence. They're not as uh, volatile as, as cedar. Um, and simply moving things away from, you know, we're so classic in that we plant this little seedling right next to the house and then 30 years later it's huge and, it, and uh, you know, backing things away from the house is, is key. Uh, making sure that, you know, wood piles and wooden decks and so on have some sort of security. Uh, and there's, there's that whole fire, um, fire smart stuff, which is, it's kind of no brain stuff, but the bigger issue is what's happening, uh, you know, up on the hillsides. Okay, well, I think we're uh, we're done, and I appreciate your attention. <laughs> <laughs>